This is the land of Ecuador, and it is good land. A thousand years before America was known to the world, the Andean peoples worshipped it, and in spirit they still do, for all that they have comes from the land. The Otavalos are among the oldest of the native tribes still living in this part of the Andes. They were making pottery and textiles and bargaining in this marketplace long before the Incas came to Ecuador. They were planting fields of corn and a strange vegetable known as the potato. And they were a handsome people and proud, for their strength was in the soil and they paid tribute to nobody. The strength of the Otavalos enables them to survive conquest by the powerful Incas. It enables them to survive conquest by the Spaniards. And all that Ecuador is and may become derives from that primordial strength. Because of it, festivals are held and people are gay and the marketplace is full. Because of it, dreams are dreamed and plans made and great works performed. Because of it, people travel and see the world and the world becomes smaller and friendlier. The Spaniards came to Ecuador seeking gold, and gold they found, tons of it. With it on the smoldering ruins of an Indian city, they built Quito. Many of Quito's buildings stand on the sites of Indian structures, which cover the ruins of even earlier civilizations. There are nearly 60 churches in Quito. One of the most impressive is the huge Convento de San Francisco, built with gold and silver found by the Spaniards. The convento's interior is profusely papered and ornamented with gold. Its main altar is of solid silver. Imagine the brilliance when lighted by thousands of candles. But most magnificent of all, perhaps, is La Campania, its elaborate carvings and escutcheons make it the finest remaining example of Spanish Baroque architecture. And its interior is even more richly decorated than the Convento de San Francisco. Its main altar is of solid gold, and its tabernacle is a mass of diamonds, emeralds, and rubies. But there's another Quito emerging from this ancient city. Buildings and techniques better adapted to modern life are resulting from a fuller understanding and use of the nation's resources. And this flowering of progress takes many forms. Thousands of people living in the cities now have more leisure for sports and other kinds of recreation. The ponies are at their best on this track above the clouds, and so are the spectators. Here's another spot to beguile a free hour or two. Spas like this are a popular gathering place for people from the cities and for visitors as well. The volcanic nature of this part of Ecuador imparts rare properties to their waters. Some, bottled and sold in the cities, vie with the best in the world. Did you know that the exact geodetic center of the Earth is in Ecuador? This monument, only 16 miles from Quito, marks latitude zero degrees, zero minutes, zero seconds. Members of the French Academy established this point over 200 years ago as a means of proving Sir Isaac Newton's theory of the shape of the Earth. Here you can stand with one foot in the northern hemisphere and the other foot in the southern hemisphere. In many respects, the Andean region is Ecuador's oldest. It is also the most densely populated. But it is only part of this rich country which reaches from the Amazon jungles to the Pacific Ocean and holds an astonishing variety of plant and animal life and peoples and customs. And it is still not wholly settled. For on the northwestern slope of the Andes, huge virgin territories are being opened to colonization by a new railroad. The extreme ruggedness of much of this route has made it impossible to bring in heavy machinery. 
For this reason, many miles of roadbed have been built entirely by hand. But in this region, as in many other parts of Ecuador, the unbroken wilderness will soon give way to farms and settlements. Grains and cattle and temperate zone fruits like plums and peaches can be raised in the higher altitudes crossed by this railroad. Coffee bushes and many kinds of spice trees flourish in the lower altitudes. The rich plains that stretch from the foothills to the Pacific are covered by precious woods, a bonanza for the settler who may have come only to plant bananas or cocoa. Here's a man who came close to losing his life while these pictures were being filmed. Below him is a deep, rocky ravine, and a cable system is being used to bring materials to the other side of it. Yes, it could have been serious. A new port on the Pacific is being developed at the western terminal of this railroad, and it's about 300 miles closer to the Panama Canal than Guayaquil, Ecuador's main seaport. When the railroad is finished, and it's about finished now, Quito and the other Andean cities will have a new outlet to the sea and a new area for development. If you want to pioneer and have some development capital, Ecuador's government will sell you up to 200 acres at a very low price. Future visitors to Ecuador will be able to travel almost the entire length of the country from San Lorenzo to Quito to Guayaquil, entirely by rail. Relaxed, of course, in comfortable restaurant cars. Ecuador is becoming industrialized, and when more of her virgin lands come under cultivation, there will be more cotton for her textile mills. At the present time, although she has plenty of good land, Ecuador has to import much of her cotton and some manufactured cloth besides. Actually, she needs more textile mills and more people who know how to plant and process cotton. It's quite a problem to leap into the 20th century without a steel springboard. People accustomed to old ways must be taught new. Resources must be fully used, rivers harnessed, hydroelectric plants built, and irrigation and electric systems developed. But Ecuador is doing all of that and as rapidly as she can. Her schools and colleges are adding to a growing reservoir of skilled technicians. Oil is extracted from the cotton seed at mills like this one in the town of Manta on the Pacific coast. It's a region that favors the growing of cotton. The cotton here is being dried in the sun prior to shipment to the spinning mills. The oil from the seed is utilized by food and chemical companies. Ecuador's industries today are scattered far and wide. They are revitalizing many an old city and giving employment to people who lack the means and resources to make fullest use of their land. This is Cuenca in the Andes of southern Ecuador. It's the center of a flourishing hat industry. Most of the weaving is done by women to supplement the incomes of their husbands in trade, agriculture, and other occupations. Many are descended from peoples who lived here in pre-Inca times. They're quite different from the Otavalos who farmed the hillsides north of Quito. They have their own very peculiar customs and ways of dressing and arranging their hair. But they are master hat weavers. They make the finest straw hats, in fact, that you'll find anywhere in the world. When the Spaniards reached Ecuador, tradition has it, they found the Indians wearing a cloth so finely woven, so rich in texture and so brilliant in concept that they considered it more valuable than gold. It was woven from fibers peculiar to Ecuador. From this ancient art, they say, came the present day skills, handed down from father to son and from mother to daughter. Today, there's a hat fair on in Cuenca. Buyers from around the world are here, and the city has swelled to three times its normal size by farmers from the country. This is one of the few large-scale hand industries of the world that has not been mechanized. Cuenca accounts for more than three-quarters of the four million hats, erroneously called Panama hats, 
that Ecuador sells yearly in the world's markets. How did the term Panama hat come about? It started with Ferdinand de Lesseps, builder of the Panama Canal. De Lesseps saw several Ecuador hats in a Panama store and bought one to protect his head from the sun. Others followed suit, and when the tourists came to see the eighth wonder of the world, they too bought the hats. Eventually, everybody knew them as Panama hats. Hundreds of hats are bleaching here in the sun. And here's another paradox. The Ecuador hat did not originate in Cuenca, but on the Pacific coast near the towns of Monte Cristi and Hippy Happy. Even the straw from which the hats are made is brought from the coast. Banana production is Ecuador's answer to the perpetual motion dream. You plant a stalk and it sends up other stalks. You cut down the first stalk to get its bananas and the other stalks are already heavy with maturing fruit. This goes on 12 months a year, and on the equator where climatic conditions are absolutely perfect, it's a bonanza for Ecuador and a fine contribution to the American table. Ecuador, not much larger than Colorado, is the world's largest exporter of bananas. And here's a banana blossom, the cause of it all. The millions of dollars yearly that Ecuador gets from her sales of bananas to the United States and other countries are a big factor in her nationwide modernization program. They're helping build the railroad we saw a while back. They're building more schools, highways, hospitals. It's an astonishing fact, too, that only a small percentage of the good land available for bananas is now being cultivated. Banana plantations are of all sizes in Ecuador. Some, like this one, run into thousands of acres and employ hundreds of workers. Others are small, one or two man farms operated by families. A good many Europeans have lately gone into the banana business in Ecuador. Also, ex-GIs and others from the States. It's green gold for those who enjoy this kind of life. Nearly two million stems of bananas a year are produced on this plantation. It has its own dock where fruit is received for shipment to the seacoast. But all rivers leading down to Guayaquil, the center of Ecuador's exports, are carriers of bananas. They go down not only in barges, but in dugout canoes and on huge rafts of balsa wood. Anybody who has bananas to sell can sell them in Guayaquil where ships from all over the world gather to collect them. Notice the care used in handling this delicate fruit. Each stem weighing about 80 pounds is enclosed in a plastic bag, and one vessel, depending upon its destination, may load fruit much riper than another. The United States, being closer to Ecuador than Europe, receives the ripest bananas. The vessels are refrigerated to prevent overripeness. All the exotic products of Ecuador, jungle fruits and spices, cocoa, crude rubber, emeralds and quinine flow through the city of Guayaquil. Here too, Simon Bolivar, liberator of South America, met General San Martin. The final destruction of the Spanish army in America soon followed. Guayaquil's prosperity, the result of her magnificent harbor and rich interior, extends over a vast area. Modern highways now link the city with the Andes and with beach resorts like this one at Playas. And yet, echoes of the past are everywhere present. Boats like these, for example, were probably used by the Incas, even the predecessors of the Incas. They're made of balsa logs and are absolutely unsinkable. And if it's lobster you want, or big fresh crabs or oysters, well, you can get them at any one of a number of seaside hotels and restaurants. It's only an hour or so by plane from the coast to the Andes. And there's Mount Cotopaxi, the highest volcano in the world. 
It's one of more than 20 star-scraping peaks that flank Ecuador's Pan-American Highway, better known perhaps as the Avenue of the Volcanoes. For scenic grandeur, there is nothing quite like it on the face of the earth, but it's a vital artery of communications as well. It's no easy job to maintain and improve a highway in these mountains. Ancient deposits of volcanic ash are notoriously unstable and must be cleared away, but the job must be done. For this highway links one end of Ecuador with the other. It's a feeder line for roads leading to the Pacific. And together with stretches of the Pan American Highway, both north and south of Ecuador, it provides a through route from the Mexican border to the southern extremity of South America. The section being improved here lies at an altitude of over 12,000 feet between Quito and Quevedo. Ecuador is spending $35 million for new and improved roads. She is building them through mountains and jungles and over rivers never before crossed by motor vehicles. And American machinery purchased largely with banana dollars is a prime factor in these jobs. For she is no longer the land of the Spaniard and the Indian. Her faith today is in modern techniques applied to her huge resources for the benefit of all her people. Here, for those with skills and know-how, is a land of opportunity, a land waiting as the West once waited for men of vision and courage and the ability to make their dreams come true. Here is a new frontier, a land blessed with eternal spring on the Earth's equator.